Hello, good morning, my dear students. Today we are going to tackle our last uh, session in uh, genetics, and we are going to talk about sex influence traits. Sex influence traits are somatic traits that their genes are carried on autosomes, not sex chromosomes. So why do we say that they are sex influenced if they are somatic traits? and the genes are carried on autosomes because the sex of the individual modifies the dominancy of some traits. What does this mean? This means that the sex hormones of the individual influence the, act the action of the genes. So whether this gene is dominant or recessive is controlled or affected by the sex hormones. So, the gene action is affected by sex hormones secreted from the gonads of adult males or females. So, before puberty, both males and females don't express these traits. So, it has to be expressed after puberty because it is affected or expressed only under the effect of the sex hormones which are uh, secreted in high levels after puberty. We have two uh, examples. The first example is horn in, horns in cattle. So here we have uh, the ox. The ox have large horns uh, and maybe some cows have horns too, uh, but they are not as big as the uh, horns of the ox. Uh, calf calf are small uh, uh, cows or oxes, they don't have any horns. Why? Because we said that they have to reach puberty for these uh, traits to be expressed. The second uh, example is boldness in humans. Boldness in humans, uh, we can uh, see it's uh, very common in uh, some families uh, and uh, sometimes it's not a very bad thing. Uh, anyway, boldness it uh, spreads in men of some families more than uh, females, as we just said a moment ago, because it, its appearance is affected by male sex hormones or masculinity hormones. So that's why they spread in men more than in women. Can we have a bold woman? Yes, we can. But actually, the effect of boldness is not as clear as in men because it is affected by testosterone or the masculinity hormone. So we can say that boldness is controlled by a dominant gene which we give B+, which is responsible for hair falling. And why do we give it B+, and not B capital and B small? Because the dominancy is affected by the sex hormone. So the same hormone can be dominant in uh, in uh, men and recessive in women, the same gene. So in men, the presence of only one dominant gene is enough for the boldness to appear due to the presence of masculinity hormone, while in females, it requires the presence of both genes to appear and to be in a pure state because in females, in absence of the testosterone or the masculinity hormone, the male sex hormones, they are recessive. The gene is recessive. So boldness in male and female humans. We can have four different uh, uh, genotypes. And if we have pure dominant B plus B plus in male and female, both will be bold in male because uh, uh, it is dominant and we, they have the masculinity hormones and in females because it is recessive but because they lack the, uh, the masculinity hormone but it because they have the two genes so it's a recessive gene but it's in pure state so the trait is shown in hybrid dominant one uh, of the bold gene and one of the normal hair gene in male only one is enough, so th this male will be bold because it's a dominant. And in female, the same genotype will have normal hair because only one gene is not enough because it is recessive in absence of the male hormones. 
while in pure recessive both b b no b plus at all both will have normal here so we can see that only the hybrid uh, form differ from males and females So what are the possibilities of the offspring if a hybrid bald man marries a hybrid normal woman? So a hybrid bald man and a hybrid bald woman both have the same genotype, B plus B, because we said that this is the only way, this is the only uh, option for the genotype to differ, and we have different phenotypes between males and females. Gametes we will have B plus and B and the other exactly the same. And if we cross them, we will have B plus B plus, B plus B, B plus B, and B, B. What if this first person is a male? He will be bold, exactly. And if she is a female, she will also be bold. The second possibility, if a male is bold, if a female, she will have exactly normal here because this gene here is recessive in absence of the male sex hormones the second is the same or the third three is the same and the last one have normal here for both so let's see what is the difference between sex linked and sex influenced traits first the location of the gene we know that sex linked traits are carried on sex chromosomes while sex influence traits are carried on autosomes. Sex influence, uh, uh, the effect, sorry, or the influence of the sex hormones, they don't have any effect or any influence on sex link, but they affect the sex influence uh, traits. The dominance in sex link, complete dominance, the presence of one gene is enough, while in sex influenced, one gene is not enough uh, unless we have the hormone. It needs the hormonal effect. Hybrid individual in sex linked traits, they are females only because they are carried, if they are carried on the X chromosome, we don't have any hybrids except in females. But in sex influence traits, we have males and females, same genotype but different phenotypes. Inheritance of genes. Uh, the father passes to daughters and the mother passes to both sons and daughters while in sex influence traits they are passed normally both parents pass to both uh, sexes of their offspring examples of sex linked traits we have the drosophila eye color the color blindness and hemophilia in humans while in sex influence traits we have two uh, examples the horns in the cows and boldness in humans. Last type of uh, sex-related inheritance are sex-limited traits, and from the name we can see that their appearance are restricted or limited to only one sex due to the difference also in sex hormones. So the sex hormones affect the sex-limited traits and the sex-influenced traits, and they don't affect the sex-linked traits. Examples of the sex-limited traits, the production of milk in human mam mammals, in female mammals, uh, whether humans or any other type of mammals. The second is laying eggs, which is limited only to female in birds. And the third uh, trait is growing beard, limited to males, and it is considered a secondary sex character in men. So now we studied all these uh, different uh, uh, inheritance types and uh, we saw that there are lots of diseases in that can be uh, transmitted or inherited from the parents to the offspring and that's why we need to talk a little bit about the medical examination before marriage. As we studied in the previous sessions, lots of diseases can be genetically transferred from the parents to their offspring. 
and from here arises the importance of carrying out some tests before getting married to avoid occurrence of such diseases or abnormality and this medical examination before marriage is a series of uh, medical examinations and tests that are performed on the individual who wants to get married. Why do we do them? As we said, the marriage can cause some um, some marriages can cause some genetic diseases to be inherited, especially if uh, both uh, uh, parents are uh, relatives, like cousins, which increase the possibilities of spreading genetic diseases if this disease runs in the family. But not only relatives can spread diseases if they marry without medical examination, so all young people should do this examination uh, to make sure that they are free from infectious diseases like hepatitis and AIDS, make sure that they are free from genetic diseases like thalassemia, which is a type of genetic anemia which affects the babies very uh, much and may cause death, also giving medical counsel before uh, about the possibilities of transmitting such diseases to the parents, uh, to the partner, sorry, or to the offspring. It also provides choices and alternatives to avoid such transmission to help in planning a healthy family. So we can sum up the importance of medical examination before marriage to try to give birth to healthy children and limit spreading of genetic diseases and congen congenital deformities. Congenital deformities are any abnormality in the body or in the uh, growth or in the brain growth. Uh, that is uh, um, inherited or happens uh, after birth uh, and also limits the spread of mental retardation. All these diseases uh, can cause financial problems, so we can uh, not only avoid financial problems but social and uh, psychological load of taking care of this uh, children with uh, the genetic disease. Um, now we will talk about science, technology and society and we have two very important uh, uh, applications that we can uh, use in real life. The first is the genetic fingerprint or the DNA fingerprint. In 1984, Sir uh, Alec Jeffersy at Leicester University in uh, London published a research showing that the genetic material or the DNA of any person may be repeated several times in the cell of any living organism. Uh, one year later he stated that these uh, repetitive sequences are unique for each individual, like the fingerprint, and it is impossible to be the same in two individuals except for identical twins and he called these repetitions or DNA sequence repetitions the human DNA fingerprint or what we call DNA typing. So DNA fingerprint is a sequence of DNA that repeats itself several times and it is used to identify individuals by comparing DNA fragments. How can we use it? We can use it medically to study genetic diseases or uh, to find matches for uh, tissue transplantation. Uh, second application is uh, forensic medication to identify deformed corpse. If we have, uh, uh, God forbid, a very big accident or, um, uh, or a big fire, uh, that we cannot identify the person, uh, the victim of these accidents. We can use the DNA fingerprinting to identify these crops, and also we can use it uh, um, uh, this is uh, recently used uh, a lot in tracing of missing children and also uh, we can use it in judging issues of ancestries like uh, we say that we are pharaohs or Arabs or whatever we can use the DNA fingerprint to decide uh, the race uh, also we can use it uh, to exonerate or condemn any person in uh, in some crime to uh, say that this person is guilty or not guilty if we find the DNA in uh, the crime scene. Second application is the human genome. 
and uh, it first started in 1953 when Watson and Crick, these are very, very famous uh, genetic uh, um, scientists, proved that the genes are carried on a double helix uh, nucleic acid or DNA. In 1980, the idea of human genome appeared and scientists identified more than 450 genes only. And uh, by the middle of the 80s, so five years later, more uh, numbers of genes were identified and it tripled to reach uh, 1,500. And in April in 2003, all the genes and all the sequences were declared uh, complete. The number of genes which are responsible for the enormous human characters can reach from 60,000 to 80,000 and they are carried on 23 pairs of chromosomes. Human genome is all the genes or all the sequences that are found in the nucleus of each somatic cell. How can we use the human genome? We can use it also to identify genes causing genetic disease by drawing the genetic map that identifies the location of each gene on each chromosome accurately. We can use it also to study evolution by comparing human genome with other living organisms, improve breeding, and by, in, by identifying genes of different diseases in the fetus before delivery and acting to improve them. And this is done especially in um, plants. We can use the DNA or the genome uh, to uh, breed better plants, uh, like for example, uh, plants that uh, can, um, of course this is not human genome, this is plant genome, but uh, we can use this uh, uh, to uh, improve uh, the quality of a plant that uh, give us more uh, uh, yield uh, and uh, maybe, for example, uh, resist diseases or uh, can um, bear a lot of uh, less water. Uh, we can use it also to manufacture new drugs with no side effects. Uh, that's it for me today. Hope you enjoyed our lesson and see you soon. Enjoy the rest of your day.